Welcome to Pop Culture Legends, a mini series from Digital Dissection, a nerd podcast. Pop Culture Legends explores the spaces in between mainstream and esoteric across the world of media. There's a lot to unbox across video games, movies, TV, and comic books. We hope you enjoy the spaces in between those spaces. Today's legend explores comedian Tomowaki Hamotsu, a.k.a. Nasubi, and the torture he suffered at the hands of a Japanese reality show. For over a year, Hamatsu endured an incredibly cruel and malicious series of events, all for the enjoyment of millions of viewers. While reality television is already known for using its participants in dramatic ways, Hamatsu's treatment is far above anything the world had seen before. As a content warning, this episode will discuss real events involving psychological and physical torture, mental health, and the effects of prolonged abuse. If any of these topics are disturbing, we highly recommend abstaining from today's content. You have been warned. Reality television has been a mainstay of both network and cable television on a consistent basis since the late 90s. TV shows like Big Brother, Survivor, and more properties all rely on the general public as their stars, or contestants. While these shows' popularity has endured for the last 25 years, the concept of reality TV wasn't a new one, even at this point in time. In 1948, the first show to use non-actors in its programming was Candid Camera, a show that played practical jokes on random people, hoping their reactions would garner laughs. While a fairly simplistic idea, it didn't take long for more reality content to shift from seemingly harmless to far more intense subject matter. In 1988, cops would up the ante considerably, as real law enforcement recorded their interactions with the general populace, not all of them law-abiding. MTV would build a relative powerhouse with the real world in 1992, specifically casting its members based on their personalities, creating literal powder kegs every season as complete strangers tried to coexist in a fabricated home environment. In a matter of decades, reality television went from a fairly harmless endeavor to a ratings juggernaut, so long as drama, fighting, or sexualized content reigned supreme. This very real escalation continues into the modern day, as shows like Keeping Up with the Kardashians, Real Housewives, and more quote-unquote reality shows kept the tradition of guaranteed human struggle going. What many didn't know, however, in the relative infancy of modern reality television was that halfway across the world from 1998 to 2002, Japanese TV producers took the concept to nightmarish heights. If the show Susuno Denpe Shonen isn't familiar to you, its initial concepts, when parsed out, may not seem entirely sadistic. Participants on the show were subjected to challenges that involved being placed into situations that would actually form the foundations for shows that would appear in the decades that followed. Some of these examples were being in a survival situation, and building a raft to win the scenario and escape. Others had to hitchhike across country, albeit in a foreign country, and have no resources to eat, drink, or take shelter. However, these scenarios cannot truly be understood by simplifying their descriptions, as this wasn't anywhere near what most reality show viewers would normally be used to seeing. For you see, producers of the show were incredibly hard on their contestants, ensuring that they experienced starvation in some cases, harsh weather in others, and adjust the scenarios to increase in difficulty if the participants began doing better than expected. If these were seasoned survivalists, it might make sense, but the individuals chosen for this program were almost always aspiring comedians, not individuals hardened 
or prepared for such hardships. Tomowaki Hamatsu was one of these people, an up-and-coming comedian from Fukushima, Japan. Like the other participants in the show, Hamatsu had signed a specific contract with the program's management, essentially signing his life over to compete until he reached a specific requirement to win the challenge. His mission was to generate 1 million yen, or roughly $10,000, exclusively via mail-in sweepstakes. These were contained within magazines the show's producers provided him with. While this portion of the program seems somewhat straightforward, there were other stipulations. Hamatsu was given nothing to begin the competition. He was stripped of his clothes and was completely cut off from any communication with the outside world. He was also confined to an apartment, but fortunately it at least had electricity, water, and heat. For his efforts, he was nicknamed Nasubi, which is Japanese for eggplant. This moniker would stay with Hamatsu even after the show ended, and was a cheeky way of the producers making light of him being naked throughout the show's history. Due to having no clothing at all, an eggplant graphic was placed over his genitals during broadcasts. The previously mentioned sweepstakes made it so that Hamatsu had no choice but to participate since there was no other way to survive. Initially, he received nothing from these efforts, and with only drinking water available to him, that meant that he would begin losing weight. Over time, however, he did begin earning drinks with a high amount of sugar, as well as rice. The show's producers, however, truly were sadistic. While the rice itself was a blessing, there was literally nothing that Hamatsu had to actually cook it with at first. Hamatsu would develop a system for cooking the rice via discarded packaging he acquired throughout the game. He would even later win a bicycle, and with no real way to use it inside the confines of the apartment, he adapted it into a stationary version. Eventually, he would even win a PlayStation, TV, VCR, and at least had some ways to occupy his time. He would also befriend a plush toy he would call his sensei, and routinely held conversations with it to maintain his sanity. While Hamatsu tried to calm his mind, he had no idea that millions of viewers had begun watching Susuno Denpa Shonen. Producers were extremely careful to ensure that his TV had no communicable ways of reaching the outside world, as paparazzi, fans, and media had learned of his location. Hamatsu had always thought his participation was a bizarre social experiment, but in reality, he was viewed by hordes of people, many who poked fun at his demise and enjoyed his daily musings. This wasn't an exaggeration. The show was watched by 17 million viewers, and producers took further steps to ensure that the entertainment value remained high. This involved consistently tormenting Hamatsu, while we mentioned that he had to eat raw rice, it only got worse from there. In addition to the rice, his primary diet consisted of dog food that he also won from the magazine sweepstakes he had no choice but to participate in. To further make the situation more degrading, producers even had delivery men show up to the apartment with delicious food that wasn't meant for him. It wasn't enough to mock Hamatsu throughout the live broadcasts of the show. It was an environment truly meant to torment him in every possible way. While Hamatsu's treatment at the hands of Susuno Dunpa Shonen's producers were already sadistic and inhuman, the effects on his mental state were clearly detrimental. According to Hamatsu in a New York Post interview, he mentioned, quote, I suffered mentally every day. I felt as if I was trapped between sanity and madness. 
Unquote. For those unfamiliar with the degrading conditions of prolonged social isolation, Hamatsu had many of the symptoms commonly associated with it. With the COVID pandemic, many organizations consistently shared information on the threats that long-term isolation can pose on humans. Specifically, according to a Tulane University study, mental and physical health are very closely tied together, and there are many critical risks like sleep loss, immune system deficiencies, as well as anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. Recent studies by Newcastle University and the Journals of Gerontology also point to higher risks for coronary heart disease, strokes, and a 40% higher risk of dementia because of isolation and loneliness. To many watching the show, this was purely as entertainment. But what many neglected to realize was that they were witnessing Hamatsu's mental state breaking down in every possible way. We've already mentioned how he clearly was malnourished. But over the length of the 15 to 16 months of his time on the show, his speech began to slowly get worse. As research on long-term social COVID impacts continue, evidence is beginning to point towards difficulty remembering vocabulary, maintaining concentration, and problem-solving. The fact that Hamatsu remained resilient in creating his own cooking methods, tool creation, and coping mechanisms is a reminder of just how truly resourceful he was. According to a recent article titled, Characterizing Long COVID in an International Cohort, the symptoms that Hamatsu began to display can take only four to eight weeks to begin appearing. It's horrifying to think that not only did millions of people know that it was happening, but they continued to enjoy it week after week. Producers also tried their best to ensure that the show continued, but Hamatsu not only eventually raised the money needed to best the scenario, he would do it again despite showrunners changing the show's parameters. After completing the original task of raising 1 million yen, Hamatsu was moved to a different apartment, and a similar task of completing magazine sweepstakes to earn a new milestone of combined prizes. By this time, however, he was seasoned in the fundraising method and completed it within only a matter of weeks. The producers of the show didn't like this and altered the scenario slightly, requiring more time, but ultimately, even they could not keep Hamatsu from winning. For his efforts upon completing the last challenge, Hamatsu was finally granted release from the show, but not before being unveiled before a live studio audience. Naked, as he had always appeared. To his horror, he learned the sad truth that not only had he been deceived by the show's producers, but that he had been watched by millions of people for over a year. It goes without saying that this was a truly horrific display of what people are willing to do in the name of entertainment. However, in the spirit of truly recognizing what's important, it's that Tomoaki Hamatsu not only moved on from the experience, but that he continued to find meaning in his own life. While it did take him some time to recover his speech abilities after isolation, he would go on to author a book on his experiences with reality television, and become a dramatic stage actor in the years that followed. Hamatsu further founded his own stage production called The Eggplant Way, and now performs across Japan and appeared on television in the years since. Specifically in 2016, he would even scale Mount Everest successfully, and what is both a physical and spiritual representation of the courage and grit that he truly possesses. While many like Hamatsu chase fame by participating in shows like Susunu Denpa Shonen, it's important to realize how damaging areas of reality television can be. It even led to the Japanese government stepping in to prevent any such programs of a similar nature to ever happen again. Unfortunately, despite these efforts, Sosuno Denpa Shonen would appear again in 2009, however taking form 
with an exclusively online presence untraceable to a specific country. Fortunately for Hamatsu, he was able to return to a relatively stable life despite the harrowing events. If anything, his story is a testament to the enduring ability that many humans have when subjected to survival scenarios such as this. Despite everything he endured, Hamatsu remains a positive influence, and he has advice for anyone else who might consider chasing fame. In a 2020 interview with Style Koryama, he states, quote, Find little pieces of happiness in daily life while managing to sort out your feelings. For me, the standard of happiness is low. I can be happy ridiculously easy, but when more people around me are happy, that sometimes leads to my happiness unexpectedly. I'm happy too, if people around me can smile or be happy by something that I do. Unquote. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Pop Culture Legends, a digital dissection miniseries. Be on the lookout for future episodes as we explore the relative unknown, as some of pop culture's stories lie just outside mainstream periphery. If you like this short, why not like, subscribe, and comment as part of the digital dissection community? Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as our dynamic content on YouTube. Tell us what you think. We'd love to hear from you at digitaldissectionpodcast at gmail.com. And until next time, keep on dissecting. And like Mr. Nasubi, think about your own happiness and what it truly means.